I have a good relationship with Justin Trudeau. I really did. I, other than he had a news conference that he had because he assumed I was in an airplane and I wasn't watching. He learned that's going to cost a lot of money for the people of Canada. He learned. You can't do that. You can't do that. The trade war between Canada and the U.S. is escalating. Trump's latest tariff threats and harsh words against Prime Minister Trudeau were echoed this week by his closest economic advisors. In an interview, White House trade advisor Peter Navarro said, quote, there was a special place in hell for Trudeau and accused him of stabbing the president in the back after announcing retaliatory tariffs on steel and aluminum. North of the border, Canada is not backing down either, promising perfectly reciprocal duties if Trump follows through with tariffs on the auto sector, which would be devastating to the Canadian economy and to the U.S. one as well. And now Trump announced he would slap 25% tariffs on $50 billion worth of Chinese goods pouring into the U.S. Is the world moving away from free trade? How can Canada de-escalate the trade war with the U.S.? Let's find out. Joining me now is International Trade Minister François-Philippe Champagne. Minister, good morning. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be with You're you. You're a very busy man and the world is going very fast. I want to uh, ask you about these new U.S. tariffs on Chinese goods, $50 billion. That sounds like, like a huge amount of money, but these are the world's two largest economies. Are they going at war with each other? Is this an all-out trade war? Well, I would not use that word. I would rather say that uh, I think what the U.S. is, is doing is forcing a dialogue. I, I think if you hear the U.S. rhetoric is about trade imbalance, as they used to call it, uh, I think what they're trying to do with, with China, and you know, these discussions have been going back and forth. Uh, I just saw um, Secretary Ross not too long, he was leaving for China. I, I think they're trying to send a message. There, there's issues about IP, as we know. Yes, there's this issues. Is theft of intellectual property That's what they more say. than the trade imbalance. That's what he invokes with Canada and with his other G7 partners. Here, he's going differently, he says. But what I see in, in that, Joyce, which is more concerning, at least from my perspective or the Kenyan perspective, is an erosion of the rule-based trade order. Uh, we see that the rule-based trade order is under pressure, uh, and I would say under even threat, because all these actions that are outside the rules that we have established after the Second World War, which have provided stability, predictability, but above all, peace uh, in, in between nations, in organizing trade, you know, because we only win because we have rules. In the absence of rules, I've said it to a number of times at the WTO, we all lose. So I think what we see now is that nation states, and we've seen it, for example, when the United States decided to impose tariffs on Canada, invoking national security. So when you do that, you start eroding some of the principles because you allow other nation eventually to do likewise. Okay, so how now that we're sitting at the table with the Americans trying desperately to renegotiate this NAFTA agreement, so how can you trust them? Well, I think you go back to basics. I mean. I often talk about the Canadian exception, not even an exemption. Why? Because the difference between Canada and other countries is that we don't sell to the United States. We make the things together. So for me, NAFTA is all about modernizing an agreement that also reflects, Joyce, the supply chain that have been put in place for the last 24 years. And, and obviously our policy is to modernize them because you know, when you look at suppliers and buyers, they've not been organized around the border. They've been organized within this big trading block, which is obviously NAFTA. And because of that, we have provided millions of middle class jobs on both sides and benefits to consumers. So whilst we want to modernize, we need to go back to the basis. But it's this supply chain that is being threatened by the president of the United States when he, he threatens to slap tariffs on autos. That hits at the heart of the deal, the trade deal that Canada, the U.S. and Mexico have. So. What next? What other industry is he going to hit next? Well, I would say to you, you know, we've seen it before. Let me give you an example when we saw softwood lumber, for example. You know, our position has always been a decision on one side of the border would have an impact on both sides of the border. In softwood lumber, if you look at the reality today, we're selling more softwood lumber to the United States at higher prices. But who has been paying for that? 
if you look at the U.S. Home Builder Association report, they would say that a single dwelling today in the United States costs about nine thousand U.S. dollar more because of the price of softwood. So our point is to say we need to keep that border open because the way we have organized our supply chain provides benefits for workers and consumers on both sides. If you're disrupting that, obviously this will have consequences on both sides. That's our point. But you know, your points are reasonable, facts matter, the Minister of Foreign Affairs says, and, and as a journalist, I totally believe that, facts do matter, but they don't matter to the President. You have been saying the same things to the Americans over and over and over. You have gone there with all your statistics, all your reasonable arguments, and the President is not listening. So he hit uh, steel and aluminum, softwood lumber before steel and aluminum, the auto industry. What industry, you, you have to stay one step ahead of the devil, what is the next industry because he's pressuring you, this is a pressure tactic at the negotiating table. So. What's the next industry he's going to hit? What is your prediction? Well, you know, first of all, let me say, we will continue to do diplomacy the Canadian way, which is the one to be positive, constructive, and firm to defend our workers and our industry. That won't change. Because we know that, you know, uh, you know when I came in, in that job, my first thing was the diversification imperative. But understanding that the U.S. will always be our largest trading partner because of the size of the economy or the proximity. But at the same time, as you saw recently, Joyce, we opened the European market last September with the CETA agreement coming into force, opening up a market of 500 million consumers to Canadian businesses. We're doing the same with the CPTPP. You saw this week I introduced legislation to ratify that agreement. Why? Because we want to provide more opportunities, more market for small and medium-sized businesses and their workers and communities to, to look at other markets. So whilst we are engaging with the United States, which is our largest trading partner, we're keeping sight as well as where is the world economy going? Where is the growing middle class? Where can Canada make a difference? But tens of thousands of jobs here are at risk, on our side and on the American side. Uh, Quebec has already said that they will compensate the uh, industry of, of steel and of aluminum what will the federal government do when the axe comes down, when the pain is felt? What will the federal government do for these workers and for these companies? Well, first of all, we always have their back. And they saw it when it was about softwood lumber. We went to the barricade to fight for them. And as you see now, the situation is different than what, when we had the tariffs. Uh, one thing I'd say, you saw Prime Minister Trudeau. I mean, like I said, you know, we're positive, we're constructive, but we're firm. When it comes to defending our workers and our industry, we are firm and we will remain firm. You know, we don't want to escalate, but uh, we don't want to compromise either. Compensation? Are you considering a compensation package for the steel and aluminum industry? For the time being, what we're doing is to fight for the jobs, is to fight to get a permanent exemption, and I would even call it the Canadian exception to say to our American friends and allies that Canada cannot be treated like other countries. You're a very busy man, François-Philippe Champagne. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. That was so interesting, and it's I'm sure we'll pleasure. talk again. Definitely. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.